Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Margaret Salucci, Director of Communications for the National Association of School Nurses, and I will be moderating today's webinar, Collaboration Between Allergy and Asthma Network and the National Association of School Nurses. We will be discussing allergy management in the school setting with a focus on the role of the school nurse. As we move through today's program, please write down any questions that you have in the question box and we will answer as many as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Today's speakers are Nicoli Bobo, Director of Nursing Education for the National Association of School Nurses, and Sally Scheschler, Director of Education and Allergy and Asthma Network. Nicoli has 16 years experience providing tools, resources, and educational offerings to practicing school nurses as the Director of Nursing Education at NASN. She co-authored the NASN, NASN framework for the 21st century school nursing practice and is current project director of the CDC-funded cooperative agreement, Collaboration to Support Students with Chronic Health Conditions, a project that targets students with diabetes, asthma, seizure disorders, tooth decay, and anaphylaxis. Prior to NASN, university faculty positions, Regis University, Denver, Colorado, University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, included curriculum development and teaching undergraduate and graduate nursing students about the importance of evidence-based practice, primarily in the area of community and public health. Sally has a strong background in school nursing. Sally has worked closely with schools, school nurses, and families to manage allergies, asthma, and anaphylaxis. She has been a school nurse in public and private schools and worked as a school nurse teacher. Sally served as the executive director of the New York Statewide School Health Services, where she worked on a team that developed statewide guidance for the care of students with food allergies. She has helped develop the state guidance, guide, guidance and led an interprofessional team that created school policies and protocols for management of food allergies in the school setting. She has provided input and testimony on allergy management to the CDC and Institute of Medicine. But most of all, Sally is about the children and helping each one learn to manage their allergy and live a full and healthy life. Today's key question is, what you need to know to keep students safe at school? We'll be looking at the basics of allergies, safety information for school and resources you can use to educate school staff and students. Well, it's time to look at our Allergy 101. Sally? Thank you so much, Margaret. I appreciate you being with all of us today. So first thing we want to talk about is defining anaphylaxis. One definition that's very simple is that anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening allergic reaction, usually to food, venom, medication, or latex. The clinical definition is a little bit uh, more difficult because for years, anaphylaxis did not have a clear, consistent definition. It's kind of like if you've seen one case of anaphylaxis, you've seen one case of anaphylaxis. It looks very different in different people, and it's very different for each person each time they experience it. But that, the clinical definition is that it's a condition caused by an IgE-mediated reaction that is often life-threatening and almost always unanticipated. Anaphylaxis occurs in 1 in 50 people, but it may be even higher in prevalence. It can begin seconds after exposure. However, it might be hours uh, after a food ingestion or a venom uh, experience before symptoms appear. When looking at symptoms, any of these symptoms that are persistent and severe uh, can be an indication of anaphylaxis. In the lungs, being short of breath, wheezing, having a repetitive cough. With the heart, it's pale, being blue, faint, having a weak pulse, appearing dizzy or confused. The throat, uh, tightness, hoarseness, trouble breathing or swallowing. And in the mouth, we might see obstructive swelling of the tongue and or lips. And with the skin, hives over the entire body. Now, anaphylaxis is not usually just have one 
a, a symptom that occurs. So often there's a combination of symptoms from different body systems. With the skin, you might see hive and an itchy rash with swelling of the eyes and lips that occurs at the same time as the GI symptoms of vomiting or cramping pain or diarrhea. You might see a runny nose or sneezing, swollen eyes or that really phlegmy throat that would occur with confusion or agitation. And sometimes people that experience anaphylaxis have this feeling of impending doom. Something really, really bad is about to happen. The average time to respiratory or cardiac arrest due to anaphylaxis varies by the cause. With food allergy, it might be 30 minutes. And this is all the way to respiratory or cardiac arrest. Uh, venom allergy, it's, it's short, the time is shorter, it's 15 minutes. And for a medication allergy, it can happen as quickly as five minutes. At the network, we prescribe to the saying of epinephrine first, epinephrine fast. And if, if you hear one thing, it's that epinephrine is the only medication that can reverse the life-threatening symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction. We'll talk a little bit more about antihistamines and epinephrine in a couple of minutes, but please always remember epinephrine first and epinephrine fast if it's anaphylaxis. When we're talking about allergens, uh, food allergens are one of the first that come to mind in schools. They're not the only ones, but it's, it's often an issue that we're dealing with in the school setting. We're seeing the top eight allergens here. We see tree nuts, peanuts, eggs, fish, dairy, wheat, soy, and shellfish. And what we're seeing now, too, is that sesame is gaining attention as that ninth food allergen because its prevalence is on the rise in the United States. There are some myths that people believe about food allergies, and we have a few of them right here for you. And one of them is, is that severe food allergy reactions can be treated with antihistamines. Well, antihistamines are very appropriate to use in a mild allergic reaction. But if you're talking about anaphylaxis, the drug of choice, the gold standard is epinephrine. Antihistamines will relieve the non-threatening symptoms of an allergic reaction. But if life-threatening symptoms develop, epinephrine is your drug. A antihistamines can take between one and two hours to reach their peak uh, of uh, performance that they will do in the body, whereas epinephrine is within minutes. Another myth is that children younger than three years old can't be tested for food allergies. And we see no limit on food allergy testing, no age limit. But if you, you do have an infant that you're concerned about, a pediatrician or board certified allergist should really be uh, involved in the, in the food allergy testing. Another myth is that parents should not introduce common food allergens into their child's diet before the age of three. But since the LEAP study that was done reg regarding peanut, recommendations have been changed by the American Academy of Pediatrics to introduce peanut at four to six months unless, and this is kind of key, unless there are already signs of allergic disease in the family. Anytime you're concerned about allergies, you're going to hear me say it once, you're going to hear me say it several times, you should be checking with your health care provider or a board certified allergist. Children with egg allergy is another myth that they should not be getting the flu shot or the MMR vaccine. And children with an egg allergy, anyone with an egg allergy may receive the flu vaccine, but they should be monitored in the doctor's office for 30 minutes following. Doctor's offices will have epinephrine on hand, and if there were to be any issues, that could uh, be employed there. But at the same time, they really say that it's more important to get the flu shot than to worry about the egg allergy. And our last myth on this page is that gluten is a food allergy and eliminating it from diet will help you feel better. Well, gluten isn't really a, an allergen. Gluten is a protein composite. It's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And this is an issue for people with a gluten intolerance or celiac disease. And they really do need to avoid gluten to feel well. Uh, but, but it isn't technically an allergy reaction. 
So an important question that often comes up when children come to you and a parent might say, you know, my child has a milk allergy. Well, what you want to make sure is that is it a food allergy or a food intolerance? And this is where I think it's really important for school nurses. If a parent comes to them and says that the child has an allergy, I always like to ask for a diagnostic statement from the doctor and just say, you know, I'm going to be able to help you get uh, food uh, ex exchanges and things from the food service. And I want to get this correct in the medical record. So if you could please have the doctor write to me a note that says that child has that allergy. And sometimes then you'll notice the parent backpedals a little bit and says, well, they've never really been diagnosed, but I know they've got an allergy. So again, sometimes it's really important to help parents understand the difference and school staff between a food intolerance and a true food allergy. So one thing you want to think about is where does the reaction take place? And in a food intolerance, it takes place in the digestive system. You can certainly be anywhere from mild to very moderate discomfort if you have, say, lactose intolerance. Uh, and, and it's all GI symptoms. You know, it's going to be maybe a little bit of nausea, but uh, usually there's flatulence involved. And, uh, and diarrhea is certainly this person's best friend at times. But, uh, and, and, then, and then the onset of symptoms occurring may be delayed with a food intolerance. It might be right away, but it might be 12 hours, might be 24 hours. And the action to take here is to see your health care provider. There are some, uh, in the case of lactose intolerance, there are over-the-counter medications that you can take that really help. And, uh, and that, that's kind of the story of, of, a, of a food intolerance. However, a true food allergy occurs in the immune system. And these can be life-threatening. They affect multiple body symptom systems, the skin, respiratory, heart, and or gastrointestinal. And the onset tends to usually be immediate within 30 or 60 minutes of either ingesting or having uh, like being stung by an insect. But this is mostly for food allergy, so ingestion of the food item. And the action to take is if anaphylaxis occurs, you don't wait, you call 911. And if the person has a known allergy and they have an emergency care plan and epinephrine can be uh, administered immediately, that's certainly going to want to be one of your first steps. So uh, when it comes to insect venom allergies, uh, certainly, you know, we want to react in the correct way if a child has been stung. So what do you do if a student has been stung? And uh, you're just going to want to flick the insect away from the skin and you want to walk away from the area. Don't run. Some insects will be threatened by quick movements and they might attack more in, in more of a swarm. But also running may increase your body's absorption of the venom. And if you say, gosh, I really don't have to worry about a lot of uh, insect stings, we actually had a situation in our school district where a fifth grade class went to a park on a field trip and one child thought it would be really funny to pick up that, that, that log and hit the bees, the bees nest they saw on the ground. And let me tell you, they not only did multiple children get stung in that situation, the bees followed the kids back on the bus so that by the time the bus got back, more children had been stung. And I got to tell you, that school looked like a scene out of the old show ER by the time we were done with the day. But, uh, but so you don't want to increase the absorption of the venom by running, but you do not want to excite the bees or insects any further. If a stinger's left in the skin, and that's the telltale mark of a honeybee sting, you want to scrape it off of the flat surface like a credit card. If you use tweezers or your fingertips, that could actually squeeze more venom into the sting area. You want to apply ice to the sting area to reduce swelling. You can expect local redness and swelling. That's not going to be anaphylaxis. But uh, you want to watch for the symptoms of anaphylaxis because they can uh, come on fairly quickly. And again, it's just the kind of symptoms we were talking about. They're the same kinds of symptoms that you're going to see, whether it's a, f a food anaphylactic reaction, medication, but this time it would be because of a bee sting. And, and I want to know how they got the picture on this slide because that bee is obviously stinging someone right this minute. But uh, the symptoms that we see here are really indicate a need for immediate treatment. And they need that auto injector, that epinephrine auto injector. And then they want to, you want to make sure that they get medical assistance at an emergency um, room. 
So another type of allergy that we see in the schools is a latex allergy. Latex affects one to six percent of the general population. And this is if you're a healthcare worker that has been in the field for quite a while, latex allergy is probably something you heard a lot about years ago. Uh, but we do still see uh, almost 34% of dental care workers that have a latex allergy and 10 to 17% of healthcare workers as well as 17% of restaurant workers. And this really all started with uh, the use of the latex gloves. Uh, at one point, it was seen as just, you know, a, a wonderful thing to have such access to latex gloves. And especially when bloodborne pathogens became a major issue, that's when we saw a lot of people wearing latex gloves a lot of their day, and we saw a lot of allergies develop. But in the school setting, the person you're going to see that might be the most at risk for a latex allergy would be a student who has had multiple surgeries. And these are often our students with spina bifida, because not only have they had a lot of surgeries as a young child, they also use catheters and other things that might include latex. So you want to definitely have an eye out for that. So latex allergy occurs when there's a reaction to a protein, and it, it's, the, it's the sap from the rubber tree, and it's a milky fluid. And honestly, it's used to manufacture more than 40,000 products. And they include not only surgical gloves, but balloons. And balloons are a huge, huge issue. So um, you want to make sure that if you've got anybody in your school that's got a latex allergy, you want to make sure that a balloon just doesn't even come in your door. Uh, so symptoms of, of the latex allergy range from a skin irritation to respiratory symptoms to life-threatening anaphylaxis. And you really cannot predict which way it's going to go if someone's exposed. I, I have a, a good friend with a latex allergy, and sometimes uh, I'll hear her say, oh, there's something around us that has latex in it. And, and she's, she's okay in a little bit, but then sometimes she's had that life-threatening anaphylactic experience. And the only way to avoid a reaction is strict avoidance of latex products. So common latex allergens are latex balloons, rubber gloves, rubber bands. You certainly see those in the school setting, but also stethoscopes and blood pressure cuffs. So we as school nurses want to think twice when we're responding to an emergency if we have a, on our, a stethoscope that contains latex or we're trying to use a latex blood pressure cuff, we might not be making a, a situation any better. Mouse pads can have latex in them, and then also goggles. But there's a much longer list than this. This is just common things. But you want to really be careful if you have a student with a latex allergy. And the other interesting thing about latex allergies, and I didn't learn this till very late, much later in my school nursing career, is that there are foods that have the same kind of protein in them as latex. And they're called cross-reactive foods. So if someone has a latex allergy, they will very likely react also to the, the foods you see here. Apple, avocado, banana, carrot, celery, chestnut, kiwi, melons, papaya, potato, and tomato. So if you've got someone who's having trouble with those, you want to set, tuck in the back of your head to think, we maybe need to see if there's a latex allergy going on here. There are some other additional types of allergies. Sometimes you have an allergy and the cause is completely unknown. It's like you could be the best epidemiological detective and you'll never figure it out. Uh, medication is another one. We probably wouldn't see this at school, although a student could bring an antibiotic in that they have not yet taken uh, and, and we could see a medication reaction. But those will most likely uh, happen at home. But believe it or not, you can also have an anaphylactic reaction to exercise. So you want to always just have this in the back of your mind. Another important thing to think about as we're caring for students that are at risk for a life-threatening reaction is what are children capable of developmentally? Chronological age is not a good measure as different children mature and have different capabilities at different points in their lives. Uh, there are children that are that are six years old that I would trust to carry their epinephrine auto injector, and there are some high school kids I probably wouldn't want them to do it. So you want to think about uh, the general, the typical developmental stages 
And if we start with early elementary at six to seven years old, these children are looking to parents and adult caregivers to help that child navigate separation from the parents. And their self-care skill that they're learning is learning to trust, communicate, and cooperate with other caregivers. These kids, you might actually need to help teach them how to say, I think I'm having an allergic reaction. I had one little boy who would used to, when, when he first came, and he, was, he was, had a very severe peanut allergy. And I said to him, uh, so, so tell me what you would tell me if you were, felt like you were having an allergic reaction. And he said, I would say my mouth is hot. And I was like, okay, I can just see myself with 12 kids in the health office saying, have a cold drink of water, I'll be with you soon. Whereas I would want to know that because that's his way of saying, I'm headed for trouble. So you might want to help kids understand how to tell you that they're having an issue. For upper, upper elementary children at ages 8 to 11, they're really starting to focus on their peers and establish those friendship relationships. And parents can help clarify the child's responsibilities outside the home, like following safety guidelines and social behavior um, you know, issues. For their self-care skill, they can recognize symptoms and independently request or use their medications appropriately. Middle school, 12 to 14 years, parents really provide a framework for increased independence and learning life skills, and also discussing how to develop strategies for more complex tasks. And so the self-care skill here would be to develop um, a daily medication routine and also understanding when it's appropriate to use some kind of a uh, relief medication. Teens that are 15 to 17 years old, here parents are simply assisting them in making really good decisions about managing their symptoms, and they really can start to take responsibility for their daily meds. And older teens, parents support self-care and are available as they need, but really, as school nurses, our goal should be that as we, we launch children from their K-12 school experience, that they should really be independently managing their own health care needs. And it's really important, especially for children at risk for anaphylaxis, that they would know what to do in an emergency and how to take care of themselves. We're going to look next at some school safety guidance for allergy management. There are four components of allergy management at school. We're looking at planning and coordination of care, educating staff, students, and parents, providing a safe environment, and mounting a prompt emergency response when needed. Be nice if we never needed one. But when we're talking about education of school staff, what do they need to know? They need to know what to do if there's an emergency. Uh, they need to know how to react quickly and hopefully confidently. And they need to also uh, really understand uh, how to administer an emergency care plan. They need to understand federal laws. They need to understand that a child's got a right to privacy for their health information. They need to know that the American Disabilities Act protects them as well as Section 504 and FERPA, which is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. The FERPA protects them from all of us standing in the hallway and discussing their health issues, but sometimes school staff needs a reminder about that. State laws, there's regulations and district regulations from each state, and they're different state to state. And then also there's district level policies. So epinephrine administration is, uh, you, we got to make sure that with stock epinephrine, that there's appropriate people in the school prepared to administer epinephrine as needed. And this is also a delegation issue. Uh, at different states have different delegation uh, rules and laws, and you need to know what those are in your own state. We need to have school staff empower children and encourage safe ma self-management. And also, we have to understand that a chronic health condition really does affect behavior and sometimes a child's ability to learn. We need to help school staff understand that sometimes these kids need emotional support. Uh, not only the child that might have an allergy or a food allergy, but also children who might witness a severe food allergy reaction. You know, if, if there is an emergency, things tend to move quickly, fast, and it could be pretty scary for a child who doesn't understand, especially a young child who thinks maybe they're next. Uh, and, and, you know, you really want to make sure that you're, you're taking care of everybody. Um, school staff needs to understand what uh, exposures, what triggers, you know, what allergens are going to affect which kids. And, uh, you know, and you want to do this uh, without um, 
without, uh, what do I want to say, without impacting a child's right to confidentiality. But you need to have them understand that, you know, there are kids in the school with a peanut allergy, with a milk allergy, and what would you would do, need to do for each. So we also want to make sure that we're fully integrating children with allergies into their school and class activities. Um, a lot of times there's concern about, well, can I just tell a child with an allergy if they don't bring their EpiPen in? Can I tell them not to go on the field trip? But Section 504 uh, law protects the child. And pretty much if a child cannot go on a field trip for a medical reason, nobody can go on the field trip. So uh, what you want to be thinking about is reducing that risk of exposure in, to allergens in classrooms. And you want to think about how you're going to handle meals and the non-academic outings and field trips. Field trips are a huge issue for kids that are at risk for anaphylaxis. You want to think about official activities and before X and after school programs, and then events sponsored by school programs that are held outside of regular school hours. And then the, in, it'd be nice if all our prevention would work beautifully and we would never have an emergency response at school needed, but you do need to have a school-wide emergency response. And you wanna think about the assigning roles to staff. Uh, I worked in one school, it was a well-orchestrated dance whenever we had an emergency. I would simply call 911 on the walkie-talkie. The school secretary would galvanize into action. The assistant principal would come to my office and do whatever I needed him to do. The school principal would be on call. And we just had it all ready to go. And if, and when I would could tell the assistant principal, he would have all that student's um, information copied and ready to go when the ambulance came. Secretary would meet the ambulance and bring right to the site of the emergency. So really developing what would you do for a school-wide emergency is important. You also want to think about your emergency care plan. I firmly believe that every child that has an order for epinephrine in your school should have an emergency care plan. And then not only that, but then all their teachers, any adult that is potentially in a supervisory role with that child should not only know where the emergency care plan is, but be familiar with it and know how to administer it and be willing to. I think as school nurses, we can do a lot to relax staff and help them be confident in responding to an emergency. And then one step I think often is missed after an emergency is a debriefing meeting. Um, bring together the people that were affected by the emergency incident, the staff members, and really talk about it. Talk about what went well, what could be done better the next time. And sometimes you just need to, uh, to, to, uh, comfort them. Sometimes a staff member can can react very appropriately during an emergency, but be very upset after the fact. So you want to think about that with your staff as well. And Nicolee, the next part is yours. Well, thank you, Sally. And thank you for inviting NASN to be a guest presenter. So Sally's given us some great um, strategies to incorporate into school nursing practice. So I wanna step back or step up and talk a little bit higher level about the role of the school nurse in allergy management. When you think about the role of the school nurse in the management of severe allergies and anaphylaxis, providing care coordination is one of the principles of NASN's framework for 21st century school nursing practice is top of mind. But the other key principles are also part of the school nurse role. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in just a moment. Before I say anything more about the framework, I want to pause and talk a bit about the whole school, whole community, whole child model. And I'm wondering how many on the call are familiar with this model. I wish I could take a poll. It's often referred to as the WISC model. School nurses may understand why effective management of chronic health conditions in school is critical for a student's health and academic success. But working within an educational setting, it's important to speak the language of educators when building the case for the importance of addressing allergies and anaphylaxis in schools. The WISC model expands on the traditional coordinated school health model, a mainstay of school health in the United States since 1987. Educators have long viewed the coordinated school health model as primarily a health initiative, thus gaining limited traction in some parts of the country. 
In 2012, the CDC and ASCD, the Association of Supervision and Curriculum Development, began to work together to explore ways to more fully engage both health and education to improve each child's cognitive, physical, social, and emotional development. The WISC model was the result, a model that combines and builds on the elements of the traditional coordinated school health approach and the whole child framework and is being embraced by school health and education leaders alike. It highlights for both education and health leaders the importance of a student-centered collaborative approach to learning and health. The WISC model includes key factors that need to be in place to support the link between health of students with severe allergies and learning. Now, hopefully everyone on the call is familiar with NASN's framework for 21st century school nursing practice. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this slide. The framework is aligned with the WISC model. And you will note both models have the student in the center. And ASN's framework demonstrates how school nurses work within the context of the WISC model, in particular, the health services component of the WISC. Planning care for students with severe allergies and students at risk, known and unknown, for anaphylaxis involves addressing many components of the WISC model, but in particular, health services. The framework provides guidance on the skills needed for 21st century school nursing practice, in particular guidance for your role in making sure, sure the school health services are in place to address allergies and anaphylaxis. There are two references on the reference list at the end of the slides if you need more information about the WISC model. It's, we've listed the original publication from ASCD and CDC and just recently released, actually just this week, by the National Association of Chronic Disease Direct Directors. There is a um, publication on the model and tips for implementation. And those of you that receive NASN's weekly electronic newsletter, there's actually a blurb in there about um, a recorded webinar about this document that was just released and some model or some examples from Boston School District. School nurses daily use the skills outlined in the practice components for each principle in the framework when caring for students with allergies and the risk for anaphylaxis. For example, standards of practice principle, you use evidence-based best practice clinical guidelines and resources, some of which we're gonna go over soon, and you can apply the WISC model and the framework. For the leadership principle, you advocate for student-centered school policies that address allergies and anaphylaxis. For the quality improvement principle, you know the importance of documenting the planning, implementation, and evaluation of care. For the community public health principle, you focus on your population of students and case find students with known allergies and conduct surveillance to pick up on students who exhibit signs and symptoms of allergies and or anaphylaxis. You also connect families with community resources. And for the care coordination principle, you develop student health care and emergency plans and teach school personnel about actions to take for students with allergies or those having an anaphylaxis reaction. Um, actions that Sally just pointed out for you. Now, I would like to point out there is evolving evidence in the literature that shows when, a, when school nurses are involved in care coordination in particular for students with chronic health conditions, and that includes severe allergies, there is improved health care use and coordination, improved school attendance, medication adherence, and quality of life. Others have found improved health outcomes, such as um, improved blood glucose control, and self-management and family support is fostered. The end result, improved readiness to learn, classroom participation, and academic perfor performance. Note that there are references to these, this literature found on this slide. NASN, your professional practice organization, strongly encourages you to include the evidence-based approach provided by both the WISC model and the framework in your thinking, planning, and actions when addressing allergies and anaphylaxis in the schools. A key skill or practice component um, when implementing the care coordination principle is being able to develop student health care plans. 
A resource from NASN in developing IHPs is this publication shown on the slide, one in a series of principles for practice. This one is titled The Role of IHPs in Care Coordination for Students with Chronic Health Conditions. Emergency care plans, also discussed in this booklet, flow from the student's IHP. And I just want to note that the, um, provide the note that this booklet can be found in the NASM bookstore. Also in March of this year, AAP published guidance on completing a written allergy and anaphylaxis emergency plan and released an emergency plan that can be individualized. And if you refer to the Wang reference on the reference list, um, you can get to this um, publication. And as school nurses, you know the importance of being at the table when students with severe allergy and anaphylaxis qualify for either 504 or IEP accommodations. And I think I'm going to turn that back to you, Sally. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nicolee. Yeah, the role of the school nurse is just absolutely vital in, in the school setting when it comes to allergy and anaphylaxis management. And just when we're talking about emergency procedures, again, uh, we want to make sure that we drive home epinephrine first and epinephrine fast. Uh, make sure that you're thinking about what their st your staff roles are. And another NAS and resource that I think is incredibly valuable is uh, on, in, in, on the website, you can find policies and protocols. And there is a protocol that was developed by uh, representatives of the National Association of School Nurses, National Association of State School Nurse Consultants, and representatives from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And, and the protocol is designed to either be used by a nursing professional or by school staff uh, to help guide people as to how to react to an emergency and uh, a dosage of epinephrine and how to administer epinephrine. So I encourage you always to check that out. Another thing to think about is epinephrine storage. Uh, we certainly don't want to see epinephrine locked up. Uh, you want to make sure that epinephrine is safe and secure, but still very accessible. And that's going to be different in every school. You want to look at the expiration dates of your, your epinephrine auto injectors and make sure that you have a mechanism in order to watch that to be sure that your injectors are current. And the other thing is, is uh, you want to make sure, too, that staff should know how to call an ambulance. Very often, this will be very, very difficult for staff to do because it's not something they've done before. And they don't understand that they're going to need to stay on the line and that they should know the child's name and age and, and all the information that they're going to be asking for. And the other thing is, and this seems like a silly thing, but make sure your staff knows the address of the school because every once in a while, the ambulance will ask, you know, what's the address? And I've actually been in a district where there were two schools on either end of the town, but on the same road. So you just want to really make sure to figure out how to make sure you're going to get that ambulance and you're not going to be experiencing a delay simply because there was a communication issue with calling an ambulance. Another thing we're going to be talking uh, about in a minute, I'm going to show you the cover of a new resource that's available through Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's, it's a, a guide for schools. And one thing we offer in there are tabletop drills. And if you've never done a tabletop drill, I think it's a pretty exciting thing. And I'd like you to consider doing a tabletop drill at your school. And what this is, is where school staff, especially maybe like the school team and teacher and administrators that might deal if you especially if you have a specific specific severe allergy that you that there's a good chance that this child might have an anaphylactic episode at school this could be a meeting that's led by the school nurse now obviously you're not going to say well we're going to give the child uh, their allergen so that we can see what it is we should do but uh, so you, this is why you know you're going to do this as a meeting and discuss it but there's three scenarios available in our guide one's for elementary and that one relates to food allergies, one's for middle school, and that relates to a latex allergy, and one's for high school, and that relates to a venom allergy. And we provide you with a page of notes so that you understand uh, pretty much like how to help answer the questions for your school staff members. But here's and it's an example is the elementary scenario. And, uh, and, and we talk about, you know, uh, uh, Olivia is a second grade student who begins coughing in the classroom. And the teacher notes that there's some swelling around Olivia's eyes and lips. 
The teacher keeps Olivia calm and calls the school nurse. Olivia begins to wheeze and starts grabbing her neck. She's gasping for air and cannot speak. Now, those of you that have seen anaphylaxis know that this is a reasonable scenario. So you'd want to sit down with your elementary staff and say, okay, what do you see here? You know, what signs and symptoms of anaphylactic, anaphylaxis are present? What are you going to do first? And that's going to be a different question for every staff member at the table. You know, what, what are you going to do first? And then also, what steps should you follow next? And especially think about this as a team. And I think you would, this would be very valuable in, in preparing your school staff for an actual emergency. So questions that you want to consider is, is there an emergency care plan for this student? And if so, always initiate that plan immediately. Reactions happen away from the school health office. Who's trained in your school to respond to an allergic emergency? Sometimes the school nurse is, is not the person that's going to be able to respond the most quickly. And how is your school prepared for responding to students who exhibit signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis but have no previously known allergy? And then you want to talk as a group of, is epinephrine immediately available? Does your school have stock epinephrine? Where is the student's epinephrine stored or the stock? And can, who in your school can administer epinephrine? These are such important questions to go over as a group to be ready to respond to an emergency. And when you're looking at the role of each staff member, uh, there, there's a wonderful document uh, found in the C, from the CDC called Voluntary Guidelines for Managing Food Allergies in School and Early Care and Education Programs. And they consulted school nurses as well when this document was being written. And it talks in there about the different roles for different people in your school. So you're going to want to think about reading that to see what the school nurse role is. What's the role for the administrator? the teacher, the school counselor or mental health staff, and the school secretary who is one. Secretary and the custodians are pivotal in emergencies. And you want to make sure you adjust your roles as appropriate to your school's unique staffing pattern and school layout. If you're in one big flat one-story school, your response is going to be need to be different unless, in, in, unless you know, if you're in a compact two-story school, you might have a completely different type of emergency plan. So as we look towards emerge, uh, educational resources that are available for student and staff instruction, we want to think about what should staff know. And a few important things are how to use an epinephrine auto-injector, you want to help them understand the difference between epinephrine and antihistamine. And it's very important for school staff to know how to read a food label. This, the chart below is in our school guide, and it really talks about things you have to look. Like would, if something had a tahini sauce, would you know that that would be appropriate? not be appropriate for someone with a sesame allergy. There's so many different names for dairy products, so many different names for soy products that you'd want to make sure that they know that reading the food label, it just isn't always as easy as it might appear to be. We have some posters for schools. We have anaphylaxis at a glance. We have a peanut safe zone poster and a latex balloons prohibited poster as well. And a lot of this is found uh, in, our, in our guide, which we'll show you in just one moment. But the American Academy of Pediatrics is a great resource. And they've got this clinical report that came out. And if I could encourage everyone to do one thing, it would be to use the same emergency care plan for every student and use that American Academy of Pediatrics one. It's like the gold standard. And I think that uh, if, if every teacher was looking at the same plan, that would be go a long way towards people being comfortable. Allergyhome.org is out of Massachusetts, and they have an excellent school staff training module. They, your school staff can complete the training module, and there's a certificate available as well at the end of the training, so that you can, so that people that take it can prove that they they finished that up. And then uh, Food Allergy Management and Education, the FAME program out of St. Louis Children's Hospital. This one is online. You can just Google FAME Food Allergies and you'll find this. And it has content for the whole school community, including parents, school health professionals, and uh, teachers and administrators. And it's excellent. Here's our school guide. We're so excited about this. This guide is available to you for a free download at allergyasthmanetwork.org. 
you, you can go to our site under healthcare professionals, look under outreach, publications and special publications, and you'll see this and you'll be able to access this. You, what you do is you click on it. Uh, it's a free download, uh, but then we'll send you an email with the link in it. And sometimes look in your junk mail. School districts don't always accept the first email. So if you think, I should have gotten that, check in your junk mail and see if it's there. Uh, Nickley, would you like to speak to NASN resources? Absolutely. And um. I encourage you to search the NASN journals for the evidence-based guidance on managing al allergies and anaphylaxis in schools. We have both our practice journal, NASN School Nurse, and our scholarly journal, Journal of School Nursing. And I do want to point out now, Sally and I both now mentioned the AAP publication and their, um, their emergency care plan. And I just wanted to point out in September's issue of NASN School Nurse, there is an article about the care plan. Um, so you might want to check that out. I do want to make a note though, we have a web page, Food Allergies and Anaphylaxis, but it is currently being under review. So um, stay tuned on that. I also wanted to point out resources from the CDC. And again, Sally and I are overlapping a tad. Um, these are resources that NASN promotes in that cooperative agreement we have with CDC that Margaret mentioned at the beginning of the program. The CDC School Health Branch has some key resources on their Healthy Schools webpage, and the address is included on um, the reference slides. Once you go to the home page, you would click on the Chronic Conditions tab. You will see some other chronic conditions. But from there, if you're um, mostly interested in food allergies, click on the Food Allergy plan tab. Excuse me. Resources um, on that uh, website include Food Allergy Facts, what is a food allergy, managing food allergies, allergies at school, and that includes that voluntary guidelines that Sally spoke about. And she's also being very modest. Um, in this document, early on, you will find Sally's name and her acknowledge, being acknowledged for her contributions to this publication. Thank There's you. There's also, <laughs> of course, <laughs> gotta toot your horn, Sally. Oh, no. Um, there is a toolkit for managing school allergies at school also, and that's where Sally was talking about the role of the different school personnel. And there includes um, tip sheets and PowerPoint to help um, um, educating school personnel. There's a resources section that again has a policy guide, videos and federal and NGO resources, and a reference page. So I really encourage you to check out this web website for evidence-based tools and resources to use in your practice. And that's okay, you went to the reference slides. I pulled these together so that you had um, a, uh, a condensed version of um, places you could go, including those uh, the evidence base for the outcomes of care coordination when provided by school nurses. So I hope you find these last two slides with the references helpful. So back to you, Sally. Well, actually, it's we're going to throw this back to Margaret now. But thank you, Nicolee, for all your contributions today. Uh, Nicolee and I have been colleagues in the past and will be colleagues forever. And uh, it, it's uh, uh, my privilege to do this with you today. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Margaret? Thank you. Yes, thank you both. And we do have a couple of questions. And the first question is, my son has a level 5 peanut allergy and asthma. In his 504 plan, I have specified to administrator to administer EpiPen immediately and begin emergency procedures with any known oral exposure to peanuts with or without signs of anaphylaxis. Do you think this is a wise plan? His first allergy was severe with severe breathing difficulty. Well, this is Sally. I'll, I'll take my first stab at it. And if Nicolee would like to join in, that's great. I, I think what's important, is, you know, and the mom, uh, the, the person that's asking the question obviously is understanding that, that anaphylaxis doesn't look the same each time. And I think that's always so important to think about. But I think from a school nursing standpoint, uh, I think it's, it's uh, one of those things where some, actually some states have laws that say that if a child ingests their allergen, you treat immediately 
other states ask you to wait for symptoms. So, so there is some discrepancy there, but I would get a statement from the physician that says, how do they want that managed? I would have that as a part of the um, 504 plan. And then I would just make sure that that's on their emergency care plan and, uh, and that the school nurse is on board and, uh, and communicates that also to the rest of the school staff. So that if a child were to say, uh-oh, I, I just ate that that cookie with uh, with a with a uh, peanut in it. I didn't realize it had nuts in it. They would know to treat immediately rather than waiting to see if there was an issue. But I always like to go back to getting that straight from the physician because I think that also gives the parent power in saying my physician says we need to do this. So um, so I think that that's a, a great way to approach that. Thank you, Sally. What are your thoughts about the FAIR ECP? Nicolee, do you have an opinion on this one? Well, I think I go back to your recommendation on having a standardized um, emergency care plan. So again, if that is um, what's been adopted in the school district, to again to help everybody on, be on the same page to have a standardized care plan. Um, I think a lot of us, I guess I'll, I'll stop at that. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I got to admit, I, I'm, I'm madly in love with the American Academy of Pediatrics Emergency Plan. And one of the things I like about it is that it's very clear that, that antihistamines should only be used for a mild reaction. And I think some of the other emergency care plans aren't as clear about that. And, and, and the, I think the problem arises when people want to make one emergency care plan work for every situation. But I think it's important to remember that a mild reaction and anaphylaxis are like apples and oranges. They're different things. So I think, and, that, and that's one reason I really um, endorse the American Academy, Academy of Pediatrics uh, plan is because I think it's, it's very specific about severe allergies and anaphylaxis and giving epinephrine. So, so that's, that's why um, I bend towards the AAP and I'm completely on board with Nicolie's statement of it's good to have a standardized plan. You know, I'd like to make one other comment actually about both of these questions. Um, what you're talking about, again, a little higher level, is that, um, you know, student-centered care and having that collaborative communication, another one of those skills under the principle of care coordination, to sit down, find out what is important for the student, the individual student, what's important to the family, and then that in combination with the healthcare provider recommendations and orders. Um, it's just, I think that's what's got to be driving our practice, is to make sure that we are student-centered and listening to both the family, healthcare provider, and student. Okay, so we have another question. I work in Ohio, and I was told that epinephrine has to be locked up at all times. Can you clarify? Well, that's going to be another one of those of those things where every state has different rules. As a rule of thumb, epinephrine is not locked during the school day, simply because you want to be able to get to it quickly. I can't speak strictly to Ohio laws. Uh, that would be a good question for your state school nurse consultants, uh, because that's someone that could help you out uh, related to your specific state laws. But there are state laws that are very, very different. And, and it, as a practitioner, you know, you do need to know what laws there are for your state. Okay, so we have another question here. I have a student who has multiple severe food allergies. The parent has obtained a service dog that will sniff out those allergies. The mom wants to have the dog periodically come to the school to check for those allergens. The concern is that other children are allowed to bring those allergens for their lunches. We are worried that the dog may alert and cause alarm for the child and other children in the room. Legally, we can't tell the other children they can't bring in peanut butter for lunch. How do you suggest they handle this? Wow. That, you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> that I yeah. have to tell you, I've been doing allergies and anaphylaxis for probably, I shouldn't even admit how long, because it's probably been, we're probably edging on 30 years. 
but I, this is a new one to me. I, I, that's of course, but now that's one thing I love about school nursing. The minute you think you've seen it all or heard it all, there's something new at, and it keeps keeps the day fresh. So I, I think uh, this one would be incredibly difficult. Uh, I would I would definitely involve the school administrator. Um, I would definitely, and and they might even want to. Um, involve the student, the school lawyer, because, you know, it, it, there's going to be a real balance here between the civil rights of different parties here, you know, between the allergic child and the other children in the school. And um, boy, I'd sure like to, you know, my, my first reaction is I'd really like to not see that dog come, but at the same time, if ultimately what we want to do is keep our students safe, it's really hard question to comment on. I would definitely go and involve the administrator and uh, and and take this up a couple levels and just see, and it maybe even see if the if the student's doctor thinks that that's reasonable. And I'll just add that there is, believe it or not, a service animals in the schools position document on NASN's website under the advocacy um, tab. If you want, if that might help um, answer your question. Okay, so we probably have time for one more question. Um, can you recommend a current training program for school staff about anaphylaxis and epi use? I have an old safe at school program that is great, but this is but it um, has outdated statistics. Well, I'd like to suggest the allergyhome.org. Uh, if you go to, you know, you can even Google allergyhome.org and you get there, there is a school staff training and it, it's, an, it's a fairly, uh, it's a very current program. It's written by um, many people know Dr. Michael Pistoner and Dr. John Lee out of Boston. They are, they are uh, totally on the cutting edge of the field. And this is, is a program that they have written. So it's very evidence-based and, uh, and it does, uh, what I really like too, is that you can print a certificate out at the end to prove that you completed the training. So that would be my recommendation. And again, and just pointing back to CDC's resources on, um, you know, the different role of the different school personnel and the PowerPoints and the handouts, you might find those um, helpful as well. And Sally, will people be able to get the slides from this presentation later? We don't tend to share slides, but this will be posted on the Allergy and Asthma Network uh, webinar page under education, and you can listen to it again. Uh, certainly, if there's something like if you want to read one of the reference slides, you could st pause the, the recording right there, And uh, but you will be able to view it again, uh, it, but we don't tend to make the slides available. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Allergy and Asthma Network and the National Association of School Nurses have joined our voices to bring you with this vital information on allergy management. We thank you for listening and look forward to continuing to provide you with evidence-based information to, to enhance your practice of school nursing. <laughs>